invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 19. Psalm 19. And in our This Is Us series, we're talking about the things that mark us, things that stand out, the things that are important to us. And uh, today we talk about God's Word. We're talking about the Bible. And, uh, and it's always a privilege to, to gather together in this place. But today, and, and we always have guests, and we're always glad for guests, but I want to tell you, he, he'll, really, he'll really love me doing this to him, but, you know, my pastor is here today. Jeff Mize's father was my pastor. I, when it comes to sermons, Jimmy Mize, I heard, I heard him preach more sermons than any other person in my life, Sundays and Wednesdays and Sunday nights and all that stuff. And what an influence he has been on my life and is still such an encouragement and blessing to my life. We're glad to have him here today uh, as we're celebrating uh, Jeff's 20 years with us this afternoon. So he came in for that. Jimmy Mize, you just waved our folks a little bit. We're so glad you're here. And uh, Brother Jimmy uh, gave me a great appreciation for the Word of God and the preciousness of this book through... Uh, his ministry in my life, such a blessing to my family in so many different ways. We're going to read Psalm 19. And this is uh, just the Bible on the Bible to remind us of the power of God's Word. And here's what it says in Psalm 19. Verse 7 is where we're going to pick up. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned in keeping them. There is great reward, the benefits of spending time in the Word of God. Now, today we're going to talk about this, and we looked at different ways to, to address the day. We think about the Bible, and what's the, what's the Bible worth? Why is it of value? Well, Psalm 19 tells us a whole set of things. Why is reading the Bible important? And really, most Christians know, well, I ought to be reading my Bible. I shouldn't be spending time in God's Word. But why is it important to read this book, and why is there an urgency about it? So I want to talk about that first, and then I want to talk to you about not a personal testimony, the benefit package of spending time in God's Word from my own experience. But in, in 2017, just this last year, a national survey was conducted. It was a big study called the State of the Bible Survey, and it had a lot of interesting, revealing facts. For example, 58% of Americans... That, that's all Americans. That, that's the total population. We've got a lot, of, a lot of people far from God in our country, but 58% of Americans wish they spent more time reading or listening to the Bible. 58%. However, only 16% said they read the Bible every day. And 37% said they'd read the Bible at, at least once a week or so. Now, here's what we have learned about these studies, because we've been doing these studies for a long time. Americans are liars. And, and what that means is, when it comes to religious practice, they way over-report how devoted they are. So those numbers are actually uh, much smaller, the 16%, the 37%. So most Americans, and that was on the, on the study, 68%, most Americans say they want to read the Bible more, which maybe that one's accurate, but they're just not doing it. So why are we not spending more time in God's Word? And we say, well, it's important. It's a big deal. At our church, we say it's important. It's a big deal. But is it a big deal in your practice? Because, see, it's not just, oh, I know what I should do. That's not obeying God. Obeying God is acting on what you know you should do. 44% of Americans strongly believe the Bible contains everything you need to know to live a life that pleases God, that works the way God intends for it to work. Nearly half of Americans, 48% of American adults, believe the Bible should have more influence in our American society. That's a good, that's a good note. The vast majority, 
87% of households in these United States have at least one Bible in the home. So the Bible is available. Uh, we were talking, uh, we had a conference call last night with our team and the rest of the team that will be going to Kenya in a, about a week and a half. And uh, we talked about the need for Bibles. The, the, there's a shortage of Bibles. People do not have access to God's Word. But here, overwhelmingly have access to God's Word. In fact, the most common answer to the question, how many Bibles do you have in your home, was three in America. The most common answer. And uh, let's see, the 20% said they own five Bibles or more in their home. That should be true for a lot of you churchgoers who come out on a cold Sunday. You probably have more than five Bibles in your house. So, Bible's accessible. We know the Bible's important. We want it to have more influence in our lives. We want it to have more influence in our society. We have plenty of Bibles, and that's true, multiple translations. It's available on your phone uh, from multiple sources, multiple translations there, always at your fingertips. So here's the question. Why aren't we reading the Bible? Why not? Well, according to the survey, the number one reason why Americans who say, I wish I did, I know I should, What's the number one reason? I'll, I'll let you guess. Number one reason. Why? Why people are reading the Bible? Oh, time. I, I am too busy. Oh, man. And at our church, we don't say this all the time. It's been a while, but instead of, you need to substitute for that word. I'm too busy. Say, I am too sinful. sinful. Yes. Because if you're too busy for God, man, you took a wrong turn somewhere, and you're in deep trouble at the heart of who, you're, who you are. So the number one reason, we're too busy, just don't have the time. Survey after survey over years, that's the number one answer to that question. Why aren't we reading the Bible? It's the biggest obstacle according to so many people. And so in response to that, I'm just calling you out. That is the biggest bunch of garbage ever. Do you really think God's going for this? Do you think, you think he's going to give you a pat? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize how busy you were. Uh, and I'm going to say this in love. I get caught in a busy trap sometimes, too. <clears throat> I'll ask you some questions. Did you watch any television yesterday? Oh, then you had time to read the Bible. Uh, did, you, did you get on any social media yesterday? Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest? Instagram, you have time to read your Bible. We're going to make our application very clear. Did you spend more than 30 seconds in the bathroom yesterday? <laughs> have you read any books in the last year? Have you listened to the radio in your car? Have you ever spent an hour in recent moments, uh, recent days, on the phone with someone? Uh, Friday morning, Friday morning, Friday's my day off, and I go to the grocery store. It's my little job. Rhonda doesn't give me anything really complicated to buy. It's the routine stuff, bread and milk and all that, but I go to the grocery store early. And so there's not a lot of checkout lines open when I'm there. And It just so happened that when I got to the checkout line, there were oh, like four or five carts, and then they opened another line, and then two more people came up with carts all to check out at the same time. So now we have about seven... Uh, carts waiting to check out. And so I, sca I was at the back of this mob. So I look around, and what's everybody doing? They're all, every one of them is on their phone. That's what, they, that's what you do when you wait. You never just wait. You never just sit. You're going to reach for that phone to entertain yourself. And if you had time to do that in the grocery store line, they could, really, if you were two people back in that line, you could have read the whole book of uh, Titus in the time it took to wait in line. It's, it's, it's all time you could be reading your Bible. So you have time. And, and, I'm not, and I'm not saying that those things are bad, that you shouldn't do any of those things, not at all. But if you've done a single one of them, then yes, you do have time to read your Bible. And you're not, you just need to use your time not as an excuse. You need to use your time for the glory of God. Now, I am also not saying that reading your Bible is going to be easy. Here's one of the first reasons why. Because Satan is alive and well on planet earth and he will oppose you at any step toward God. So there's a spiritual battle that's going to take place if you're going to read your Bible. 
because he's going to create some obstacles for you, including that, that you're too busy, you're too busy, you're too busy, even when you're really not too busy. And so those are the things that Satan does. So there's a spiritual battle. You know how you overcome spiritual battles? You see what God's Word has to say about spiritual battles. And you're always going to lose spiritual battles, not just in reading your Bible, but in every other category of life until you start spending time in God's Word. So how do you do that? Well, like the Olympics, it takes discipline and it takes commitment if you're going to be successful in Bible reading and all worthwhile things are going to take those things. There are others. In case you hadn't noticed, the Bible is not uh, organized like your, uh, your little calendar where you take off a day each day and there's a little saying at the bottom of it that's a catchy little saying, ooh, that was good. It's, it's not in chronological order, though that you can do a chronological reading plan that'll help you with that. It's not structured like an encyclopedia where you just go to your subject of interest, your favorite uh, go-to. It's a little more complicated because, and not because, it, not because God's a bad editor. That's not why the Bible's organized that way. It's because of the divine intention that your Bible is a story. And this is the part of the Bible that's so important. Your Bible is a story. And it, but it's more complicated than that. It's a God story. It's a it's a story with God notes all the way through it. It's a story of people interacting with God and what they learn and how they do it, and how they do it well, how they do it poorly. They're, it's a story. It's a series of stories all pointing in the same direction at the same time. And it helps me to make sense of my story, my life, your story, your life. Your Bible is not a collection of religious stories. It is one story, one grand story of redemption, and we need redeeming. In this broken, sinful world, there is one central character in the Bible, and that is God himself, and demonstrated so clearly, expressed so completely in what we see in Jesus the Christ. And from cover to cover, the Bible is a story of the wondrous works of God. Maybe the, the four most clarifying uh, words in the Bible, uh, side by side, are in the beginning, God. And that sets the pace for everything else that's going to happen. And that's why the Bible begins that way. You're not going to understand yourself. You're not going to understand your world, the meaning and purpose of life, until you see it through the, the existence, the character, the, the plan of Almighty God. So this grand story of the works of God that the Bible records is meant to give you some gifts of incredible value. And I'd just like to talk about some of those gifts this morning that mean so very much to me. And the first one in your outline is identity. One of Satan's greatest strategies against God's people is to try to convince us that we are failures, that we're, we're never going to get it right, we're always going to fall short, that we are alone, and that we're defeated. So to accomplish that task, he needs us to agree with his lie uh, because he is a liar and the father of lies. And if we do agree, well, then, we, then we just defeat ourselves. And a lot of people are living a defeated life, discouraged, depressed, disappointed because they believe Satan's lie. But the reality is nothing, nothing could be further from the truth for a follower of Jesus Christ. Through Christ, we are always winners. We are more than conquerors, God's Word says. Paul wrote, therefore, if any, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's something that has never existed before. Something so completely, completely uh, transformed. The old has passed away. The new has come. He goes on to say, in verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. So just a, that's just a, a, a snapshot of our core identity. A new creation in Christ, an ambassador for Christ. I have a new identity. I have a new purpose in my identity. Don't fall prey to the lies of the enemy. Keep yourself refreshed with the truths of God's word. And, and what it says about you, what, what it says about your inheritance as a follower of Christ. In, in my prayer notebook, and by the way, if you would like to have, this is, I'm going to give you a snapshot, but if you'd like to have uh, identity in Christ, just a something I keep in my prayer notebook, when I'm feeling discouraged, when I'm feeling down on me, when I feel like uh, everything's working against me, and, and I feel like maybe I'm, I'm, just, I'm just missing the boat, I'll run through a list like the one I'm about to share with you just to reset, reset my heart 
to remind me of who, what my identity is in Christ. This is what some of the things that God's Word reveals about you. And we're going to run through these. Verses will pop up. I'm not going to read the verses that go with them. But it says, God's Word, I am a child of God. I am forgiven. I am saved by grace through faith. I am justified. I am sanctified. I am a new creation. I'm a partaker of the divine nature. Delivered. I am delivered from the powers of darkness. I am led by the Spirit of God. I am strong in the Lord and the power of His might. I'm more than a conqueror. I am the light of the world. I am an ambassador for Christ. And this just starts to touch the depths of what the Bible has to say about you as one of God's people. The only way you can properly understand who you are and the reason you draw breath today living on planet Earth is by what the, Bi what the Word of God, the Bible, has to say. And when you look at yourself, when you, when you see yourself not as, well, other people are putting me down, uh, comparing yourself to, to the rest of the world, it, it, those things will start bringing you down. But when you look at yourself through the lens of the story of Scripture, you find out you were made for God, by God, that everything you have, everything you are comes from Him, and you are created by God to live for something vastly bigger than yourself. God has a plan for you, and that's your identity. And find your identity, it's not in what other people say about you, not in what the, the world says, it's find it in what God says about you as a follower of Christ. Here's the second thing. When I read my Bible, uh, understanding is a Incredible value I draw. You will never know all you need to know to live life if, if you're going to base it on, well, I'm just trying to learn as I go, uh, school of hard knocks, what, what my friends tell me, what the culture tells me, research, analysis. That's why, that's why when, when God created Adam and Eve, you know the first thing he started doing? He started talking to them because he knew they were not innately equipped to be able to interpret their world and their lives and their circumstances. So God started talking to them. God's Word came close from the beginning. And I'm telling you, God's Word here is God talking to you. Just to clarify and to instruct and, and to give meaning to what's going on in your world and in your life. And apart from God's Word, we will never know, understand why we were created to live and why things happen the way they do. God doesn't just leave us hanging. But if you're not hearing from His Word, just understand, you've chosen to walk in the dark. You have chosen to, to put on blinders and stumble through. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. That is a bad plan. And most people that you're going to run into in, uh, in your day-to-day they're leaning on their own understanding, and they are they're walking through the dark. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He'll make your path straight. James says, now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. Understanding. Third thing. When I go to my Bible, and uh, there are plenty of times I need this, I need comfort. I need the encouragement in a tough world. The world in which you live can be so confusing. And sometimes, uh, I turned on the television this morning just to see if I'd missed anything in the world while I was sleeping. And uh, sometimes it just looks like the bad guys are winning. And it seems like the world is spinning into chaos. And sometimes there seems so little reason, so little purpose to what's happening to us, around us. But the biblical story confronts us with a different story. A different reality. The Bible tells us that our world is not out of control, but it is under the careful, careful guiding hand of our God. And He is the one who's going to give ultimate definition to everything that is good and true and wise and love, and we can have confidence. And that does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that I understand everything about what's going on in my world or my life, that I can see it because I'm me and God is God. But here's what I have learned, that I can have comfort and encouragement because I know the one who holds this world in his hands. In Luke 12, this is one example, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. Any of you worried today about a thousand different things? People often are. 
Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, about the body, what you'll wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. Aren't you worth more than the birds? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? If then, you who are not able to do even a little thing, why worry about the rest? Comfort, encouragement. Fourth thing, the ultimate reason for the word of God, salvation. Without, without the Bible, we would not know how grim our situation. We'd not know how hopeless we really are. We'd always think, I think I can get it done. I think I can dig out of this hole. I think I can pull this together. We would not know how helpless and hopeless we are apart from God's Word. Without God's Word, we would know. And this is how you can, you can really you can identify people who know God and people who don't. Because we wouldn't know our biggest problem is outside of ourselves. We tend to think, you know what my biggest problem is? And people say, my husband, my wife, my boss, the government. Uh, our biggest problem is always outside of us. When you read God's word, you discover your biggest problem is not outside of you. It's in you, and it's sin. And it causes everything else that you're struggling with. The biblical story is the world's most accurate diagnostic. It tells us, here's what's really wrong with you. Because it's the world's greatest diagnostic, it's also the world's greatest, greatest cure. Because it tells you how to get out of the mess that you are in because of sin. The story of Scripture is a story of redemption. It's a, it, don't you love a movie that's about a book? It's about redemption, about one who has fallen away, that, that there's no hope and they're brought back, they're restored, renewed. We need to be rescued, we need to be forgiven, we need to be delivered from our sin. And at the epicenter of this story of the Bible is Jesus Christ, the cross of Christ, Jesus who delivered us from the one thing we could not free ourselves from, not by self-effort, not by good works, not by religious stuff that we do. He's the only one that could deliver us, and he did it at the cross. He gave us what we desperately need, the one thing we could not achieve for ourselves, and that's just a whole new life, a new creation in Christ. Now, we're, we're coming off of Easter, we're going to spend time in the Gospel of John. John, when he was writing his Gospel, he said, this biography of Jesus, he said, this is why I'm writing this. They each had a purpose unique to them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John just flat out declares it. He says, these things, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Salvation. Paul wrote, and this is a great set of verses uh, from Romans. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him. Oh, we need to be made right with God. Uh, without keeping the requirements of the law, it's not based on our effort. As was promised in the writing of Moses and the prophets long ago. This next sentence, one of my favorites in the, in the Bible. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Not a mystery, not hard, not a secret. By placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone is sin. We all fall, fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet, God, in His grace, freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. It's all about salvation. It's all about us being redeemed, made right, set free from sin's penalty and sin's curse. In Him, we find salvation. The Bible tells us so. And then the last thing, sometimes we just need hope. The biblical story, because it's a story, has a plot. And that plot goes somewhere. The Bible welcomes us to to listen uh, to eternity. And as we do, we live with hope. We live with hope that what is today will not always be. Because, see, I'm not tied to here and now. This life of mine, never how many years God gives me, uh, this isn't the beginning and end of my story. My story goes into eternity because of Jesus Christ. Whatever I face in this life, 
is only for a short, short season. But the Bible tells me this. There's going to be a day when the struggle is over. And there's going to be a day when there's no sickness, when there is no sadness, when the sin of this broken world will end and we will be with God forever. We'll be made whole. The God who wrote the end of the story has guaranteed the end of the story by raising Jesus from the dead. And because Jesus is raised, he is our hope of eternal life forever. We'll be raised out of this fallen, broken world as well. Now, I just want to tell you a story. And uh, it's one of my favorite stories. It's a story from 2 Kings 6. And uh, when I think about hope, uh, it, it's such a beautiful story for me. So in this story, there's the king of Syria. The king of Syria, he just hates the people of Israel. At this time, it's a divided kingdom. So Israel is the northern kingdom, living far from God most all the time. And uh, they're located with the capital, Samaria. Well, the king of Syria, he is trying to knock off the, the Israelites. But every time he moves, they're, they're a step ahead of him. Finally, he, he decides, there, I have somebody who is betraying my trust. I have a spy in my own court because these people of Israel, they always know what I'm going to do before I do it. And then... Finally, some wise person among the Syrians figures it out. And he says, well, here's the problem. There's this guy among the Israelites. He's a prophet named Elisha. Thing is, he's telling the king of Israel what you're thinking and what you're saying before you even think it or say it. He's way out in front of you, Elisha. Well, the king of Syria decides, well, that's just not going to be anymore. So we're going to take care of him. Where is he? Well, they knew where he was. He was, he was in a, a small town, Dothan. Dothan's about 12 miles north of Samaria where the Israelite king, his, his uh, army and all were located primarily. And so the king of Syria, he drives hard with, he's got horses and chariots and soldiers, a mass army. But instead of going after Samaria, he's going after this, this prophet, Elisha. He goes all night, completely surrounds. Not a big place at the time, but he completely surrounds. a wall city, but he, he surrounds it. So first thing in the morning, Elisha, he has this servant. And uh, the servant, he wakes up. And he walks to the window. And he yawns. And he looks outside. And all he can see is enemy soldiers everywhere as far as he can see. And he completely freaks out. Oh my goodness. They have come and they, I, he, he knew. We're toast. We got nothing. He runs to the prophet Elisha. Oh my goodness. Let me tell you, we're in a mess. We're completely surrounded. No hope. Let me ask you, what does your reality look like, feel like to you today? You have some spots where you say, I am surrounded, and everything feels lost and hopeless, and I feel completely helpless in my circumstances. And I can see it. I can see what surrounds me. And it's illness, uh, it's joblessness, brokenness, fear, hurt, grief. And, and it's what you feel, right? Right? And it's all today that you can see. And, and what do you do in those situations? Well, Elisha's assistant, he runs, tells the prophet, hopelessness of our situation. And Elisha, he's a different kind of guy. He says, well, do not be afraid. My favorite, favorite sentence in the Bible. Do not be afraid because those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Elisha, you might want to go ahead and wake up completely before you start answering big questions. That seems unlikely. 
And then the Bible says Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And so God's word says the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord. So they're attacking the city now. And Elisha prays, please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elijah. Elisha. <laughs> okay. Well, things aren't always what they appear when God's at work in a situation, in a circumstance, in life. Now, a lot of times we stop with that story there because that's pretty cool. But it doesn't stop there. Because they're struck with blindness. But apparently it's not just a straight up physical blindness. It's a blindness to the circumstances. They're still, they're still walking around. So here's what happens. Elisha goes out and says, hey, who are you looking for? Well, I'll tell you what. I know. I, l- let me take you to where you should be. So Elisha. He's got the whole Syrian army following him, and he just marches them 12 miles from Dothan to Samaria, goes through the great wall city of Samaria, marches right into the middle of their enemy camp, surrounded by enemy soldiers. They're watching all this, the Israelites in Samaria, swords, spears, bows. They're ready to go, and then... Temporary blindness to their circumstances goes away, and the Syrian army now looks around. And they are, they are helpless, vulnerable. They got, they got nothing. They're feeling really small. And so the king of Israel says to Elisha, shall we kill them? And then this is where God just goes, goes off, uh, off the map again as far as how we would do things maybe. God says, no, 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 let's not kill them. Here's what we're going to do. Elisha says, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to have a great feast and invite them to be our guests. He says, okay, so you guys, you got nothing. Why don't we get to, hey, we're, we're going to have a big feast. Let's, let's pull, out, pull out the stops, get the picnic tables out. We're going to have a feast and... They have this big feast, and, and then the Syrians, after the big feast, they went back north, and it says they didn't come back to Israel again. Yeah, no kidding. But how God, he does things in the weirdest ways uh, to deliver and then to show grace to the enemies of his people. There are a lot of things about the nature of God that just... Uh, overwhelm me in stories uh, like this the bible is filled with the record of god's amazing work on behalf of his people and he still does work that is miraculous in the lives of his people and bears his fingerprints when i read the bible i'm reminded that god is hope for this life and he's the only hope for the life to come Uh, john's vision in the revelation how the story of God's people, God's world, comes to its great conclusion. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling. By the way, he's saying this to John when he's a prisoner of the Roman Empire. In exile on an isle called Patmos. God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them and they will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them and will be their God. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes death will be no more grief crying pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away then the one who is seated on the throne said look i'm making everything new now every day we tell stories we're a storytelling culture And we tell stories, and sometimes we're telling a story because uh, it's funny. Sometimes we tell a story because it's uh, it's moving. You're watching the Olympics, and you watch these folks do what they do. But uh, what the network does with the backstory behind these athletes are the things that are the most moving part. 
they tell where they came from and the effort that they had to exert to, to arrive at this place, the sacrifices that they've made, the hardships they've had to overcome. We tell stories. And sometimes our stories are sad. Sometimes they're pain and loss because we live in this fallen world. But I want to ask you today, <laughs> do you have a, have a God story? Have you spent enough time in this book to realize, I've got some stories. There's a story like Elisha, 2 Kings. I've got a few stories too. As, as we're doing this is us. Next Sunday, we'll talk about uh, prayer. And uh, those of you who've been with me for a uh, long time may have noticed somewhere along the way, I hardly ever talk about my family. I don't use my kids uh, a lot as uh, sermon illustrations or my wife. Uh, I'll aggravate Rhonda when she's here. But I don't, I don't go deep on, uh, on my family. But next week, I'm going to tell you a story that a handful of you know of what has been the most difficult thing I've ever faced in my life over the last three years. And I got a God story about it. Um, I've still kept on preaching and doing all the things that I do. But there's been a story that God's been working in my life. And uh, I'll finish up next week with uh, some of that story. That's just one of my stories. But it's a big one. Do you have a story? Do you, know, do you know the old, old story of Jesus? Have you given your life to him? And, and then, if you really do, if you've experienced that story, then, then isn't it isn't your favorite thing ever to tell other people that story? To share the story of Jesus? Uh, I love to tell the story. Of Jesus and his love. There is only, only one story that will impart identity and understanding and comfort and salvation and hope. And it's God's story. And it's got to be your story. If you're going to have those things in this life. And it's got to be a story that you tell with great joy every chance you get. Because, because this is us. We're a people of the book. Let's evermore be a people of the book.